Jed, whoever is repping uh, Caitlin Clark, if they're getting a, a, a large percentage of uh, anything, that's great for them. Even a small percentage is great for them because, well, after all the discussion about equal pay and uh, the president's tweet and, and much more, here is uh, Caitlin Clark getting her due. Uh, what's coming to her through all the endorsement deals that she will have, but did have, through the college women's basketball program and also now the WNBA with Indiana. She's the face of women's hoops. And now she has a lucrative Nike contract. Um, had a deal with Nike in college, and it was going to expire at the end of her college career. And now, well, here she is back with a lucrative lucrative deal it's uh well it's much more than the R thirty thousand twenty twenty million. 20 million it's much more Upwards than the 20 million the, the 70 thousand that uh, on average she'll make per season through just the base salary of the WNBA that's the point that we were making earlier this week is uh, basic economics looking at just the base salary and yes the WNBA they're they're getting I mean this is a great opportunity a timing the timing is perfect for when she chose to go pro and they're negotiating their media rights contract. But, I mean, if there's it, the Players Association, Chad, it's up to them to negotiate all that for all players. And it's up to Caitlin Clark to negotiate her own name, image, likeness and profit off of the endorsements. Well, they, they've lost money for 27 straight years since they started. Yeah. So um, tell me how many businesses in America would survive 27 years of losing money. The only ones that would survive are those that are subsidized by something else. And that's the NBA subsidizing the WNBA. Look, the hope is that now, for those that are outraged about Caitlin Clark's salary with her popularity as the number one overall pick in the WNBA draft, the hope is that Caitlin Clark's popularity it raises the stakes and raises the profile of the entire WNBA, and everybody makes more money. Uh, that's a win-win for everyone. And then if people are watching the sport, watching the league, then they may not make Caitlin Clark money eventually, but everyone's going to make more money. It's the Michael Jordan effect on the NBA, the Magic and Bird effect on the NBA. Uh, NBA players today need to be thanking those guys that came before them. I know that Charles Barkley talks about this a lot, that it's because of the popularity of the 80s and 90s that continued to boost the sport into a new stratosphere they hadn't been to before, and players today are really reaping the benefits of all of that. Well, WNBA players 10 years from now are hoping to reap the benefits of Caitlin Clark and all of her popularity. It's very simple economics, dollars and cents. That's why they don't make much money now, and that's why hopefully they'll make more money in the future if people tune into the sport. On this Nike deal, and this is the first thing that really makes sense to me as to why she left Iowa. She was making something from Iowa, from Nike at Iowa, but Nike spends a ton of money with Iowa. So she was never going to fully cash in because Nike knew they had her in an endorsement deal with Iowa. Now, they were good enough to sweeten the pot and give her a separate deal, and, and, and she made more money off of that. But now that she is away from Iowa, that was a Nike school, is a Nike school. She suddenly can get a lot more money out of Nike, which is what upwards of eight figures, is the report. Yeah, eight figures. So and good for her. But Chad, they they can also benefit more through more events. Like they're going to have her and the partnership a lot with with many of the players in the NBA with Nike. You know, you can do brand deals. You can do that in college, but now you can really uh, you can fuse the two. You know, the, the you you have the ability also with the. The NBA All-Star Game, the three-point contest again. Yeah. You know, all of these different options uh, and commercial benefits that you may not have had with, with Iowa through your contracts with the college. Well, she's about to be in a commercial with LeBron James. She's about to be in a commercial with, I mean, name the Nike roster of clients yeah. that's at the top. It'll you know be, what? they'll cross sports. She'll be in ad campaigns with athletes from different sports. She'll get her own ad campaign. Uh, she's going to be a huge deal. She's already a huge deal. But, I mean, Nike sees the benefit in partnering with Caitlin Clark, and, and any idiot would. Chad, so it's good, good business for her and Nike. Let's just reiterate, before the, you know, all this attention about Caitlin Clark's salary in the WNBA, no one could name the highest paid player in the WNBA. And it still can't. But last year, it was with the Indiana Fever, by the way, Erica Wheeler. 
making two hundred forty-two thousand dollars. Who I had to look up yesterday because I'd uh, never heard of Erica her. Agumba, Agumba Wale with the wings. Okay, two hundred thirty-four thousand. Name that city if we say the wings of the WNBA. This is why WNBA players don't make much money. We joke about this, but right. how many of you out there are really paying attention to the roster needs of the Dallas Wings going into this WNBA draft? Not many people. And not many people mm-hmm. have watched historically, and the hope is that now changes with Caitlin Clark because she certainly transformed women's college basketball. Well, and for a while, I believe all salaries were capped for the WNBA, like two hundred grand. But Candace well, Parker was, made that. Yeah, and there was... Um, I don't know how many players still do this, but I remember I, I worked for a pro women's team in Knoxville when I was in school there, and we'd practice against the, the ladies on that team, the, the professional women. This is right towards the start of the WNBA. Yeah. And these were WNBA players, a lot of them, and they would play either off season in this league in the United States, or they would split their time and leave that league and go to Russia and make a ton of money. A lot of the women in the WNBA for years and years would make way more money overseas because overseas they could have women's basketball leagues that would feature the best players in the world where they can't get that because the, w, because the NBA, right? So yeah. you could go to Poland and you'd have some of the best American players in the world that would play off seasons there in a league and for a team in Poland and they would quadruple or even five times the amount of their salary yeah. they could make overseas and then come back and play in the WNBA. I don't know how many st- they still do that, how- especially after the Brittany Griner stuff. I don't know how many are playing uh, in certain countries also. So um, what, is, what is the impact of this deal? Because this is uh, a marketing campaign and an endorsement deal that's going I mean everything that Caitlin Clark does is going to be the new top thing in that category like we've never seen it before in in women's basketball what do we see this the the trickle-down effect right that's where the the players are really going to make their 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 dough is going to be through the endorsements and you have to have go back to college you have to have Angel Reese as well you have to have that person to stir the pot you have to have the rivalry and I'm curious who steps up with the personality to do that. I can't tell you who the dirtiest player in the WNBA is. <laughs> no. Who's the Bill Lambier of the d- yeah, WNBA? Who's Draymond Green of the WNBA? Yeah. Who's going to talk I, trash to I Caitlin have no Clark? Idea. I, I know, but that, now's their opportunity to let us know who they are. Well, it would be great if Angel Reese becomes a superstar mm-hmm. because you already kind of have the bird magic rivalry going into the league with those two. Yeah. And she's not afraid to talk some you-know-what, and that's good. So hopefully she's going to be good on a good team, and then those two two players will match up in the playoffs, and, and it'll lead to a lot of eyeballs watching the sport. But I, I think, if I'm guessing today, she's going to make a ton of money for Nike. Everyone's going to know who Caitlin Clark is, and the WNBA is still going to struggle to find an audience in the regular season. I think that they're going to have – for WNBA standards, astronomically high ratings of Caitlin Clark and Indiana are good, and they're playing in the playoffs. But as we've talked about before, their playoffs are right in the middle of football season. Yeah. That's tough. And, and last year. That is a tough pull to get anyone excited about anything other than NFL or college football in the months of September, October, November, December. And last year, they had two of their WBA finals games on Sundays. In the middle of the day. Yeah, that, that would, that ha- that would absolutely have to change. That can't happen. Chad? I mean, I, I, if I were, what? so it's going to be uh, Disney that still ESPN has the rights to WNBA. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud here. If you have a Caitlin Clark WNBA finals that's in October, I mean, you're, you're already starting um, Monday Night Football, what, like 8.15 Eastern time? Yep. Like if you Roughly. could get a 5.30 Central, 6 o'clock Central, Lead up to Monday Night Football, that that's your lead in, is a WNBA Finals with Caitlin Clark. That's how you have to combo it because you go head to head with any NFL property for the WNBA, you will lose that battle, regardless of who's playing in that game. That, that might be the one way to, to factor it in and, and double it up. The thing is, though, they spend so, min- they, so much money and resources on the, on the ability to promote that they own Monday Night Football. Oh, and yeah. the big matchups, right? They, 
Last year, they had the, two, the, the top two games preseason-wise that they, I'm saying in May, whenever the schedule comes out, they got the top two matchups and they had the playoff game. So they, they're going to promote all day long Monday Night Football in reaction to the NFL Sunday. If I'm ESPN, I'm just trying to stagger it where it's not on, I, I'm trying to use both to benefit. You get one big night or you can have two really great nights of ratings. That's how I would do it. But um, yeah, I mean, they, I get the WMA's perspective. You don't want to like stretch out your finals into a month, you know, by playing two games is a week. Is it best of seven or best of five? I have no idea. That's because, hey, if it is best of, if it's best, if it's best of, five, of five, then it's easy. Yeah. If it's best game of one, five. Game one, game two, Tuesday, Wednesday night. Well, just don't. Game three, game four, the following Tuesday, I mean, Wednesday I, night. Honestly, right? Chet, if I'm the, I, don't go on Sunday. Don't go on Monday. I would, I would tip off on a Thursday night, and I would tout the fact I, that I blew the Thursday the, night football ratings out of the, the water. The actual competitors would hate it, and I understand all that. And if you're the league, you would hate it. But if I'm just trying to maximize eyeballs and attention, I do a best of five series, and I sp- space out over three weeks if, it ha- if you have to. But you do Tuesday, Wednesday, game one and two. Wait a week. Tuesday, Wednesday, game three and four. This is Back up, the other when there's no football going on, right. except for Maction that you're going head-to-head with, which Christmas Caitlin Day. Clark and the WNBA final. Yeah. <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday for game five. And there, I, we just became ESPN programmers for them. So the WBA You're welcome, ESPN. Expected to seek up to 70, 75... Let's see here. Expected media contract. 75 for the next long-term media rights. Uh, that would more than double the combined uh, $24 million. So, uh, I, was, I was asked a... Right uh, now they're getting about $60 million annually. Uh, I'm going to ask you this because I was on a, a radio interview today and someone posed this question to me and I thought it was a pretty good one. If you are a television network, would you rather spend your money Right now, with all the factors, considering the, the landscape of these sports and everything else going on, okay. would you rather spend your money with the Masters to have the rights to the Masters or to have the rights to the Women's College Basketball Tournament and the month-long tournament? I would have the month-long tournament. See, I answered the Masters for this reason, because I said it is a consistent brand yeah. that I know Over even with days. a 20% drop-off, it's still going to be well watched, and it's more of a, it, it's a premium brand for my network. If I'm a, a, a attached to it, you know, it's one of those yeah. that it's a luxury play. Now, I, yes, you're and, right. and you know the women's basketball tournament, the ratings will go down next year without Caitlin Clark. I don't know how much, but it shouldn't fall it's gonna to be, where it was. It, it, you're right. It, it's going to be good. I'm not saying it's going to yeah. crater, but it's going to go down a little bit, and you know that. But mm. it's a fascinating question when you think about. Quite frankly, how boring this latest Masters was. Mm-hmm. All the whatever's going on with Liv and eight hundred and fifty million dollar offers to Roy McElroy and John Rahm leaving. The sport is at a real crossroads. But not at the Masters. Of golf. At, at the Masters, everyone's going to play and it's going to be fine. But I even found that part of it to be lacking this go around. There's no Tiger Woods to save you but, anymore. But the, what's, uh, well, you're right because what's odd is he made the cut. Yeah. You know, he made the cut. And it's in not this, like the, the best player currently wasn't in the lead on Sunday, which normally would and give you, had, you a big bump. When you when you made the turn to the to the second nine, as the Augusta National calls it, you had four players tied at six under. I mean, look, if this was Max Homa and Oberg and um, Victor Hovland, we guess it's Oberg and now. a bunch of mid level guys. He may have changed it back to something. Yeah, it could, it could be Oberg again. Who knows? <laughs> But a bunch of mid-level guys, that's usually where you say, okay, now I see why Sunday was so lowly, low, lowly rated or lower than most years because you didn't have the big impact player. But Sunday at the Masters, they had Scotty Scheffler, who's the best player in the world right now and the best player on tour who's been killing it. Now, And it still didn't matter for him. If ratings. you don't have the four that, you, that were behind him and instead you have Roy McElroy, or you have you know, Jordan Spieth, then... The ratings aren't falling off. I don't think so. Yeah, but it takes it takes more than just one top player, and you, we don't know much about Scotty Scheffler, even though he's the face of the, the 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 sport right now. But they will always level up. They're always here's the thing about the, and I may lean your way now. I can't tell you who the next Caitlin Clark is. 
I can't tell you who the next Tiger Woods is. They want it to be Juju Watkins at USC, but, but you want him. We wanted it to be Jordan Spieth, right? But it's not Garrett. But well, we want it to be I, Rory. Wait, Rory, but but, but here's the thing. Tiger. Then we want it to be Justin Rory. Thomas. Then we want it to be Jordan Spieth. Yeah, DeChambeau. Everyone's puppy never. Yeah, right. And now, but I. But the thing is about the PGA Tour and live, and now just in this case the Masters, you still have about. I think the average sports fan can name off about five to eight PGA Tour players or live players, whatever, professional golfers. I don't know if – can an average sports fan name a player right now? Other In than, women's college basketball? Yeah. I don't know. No. Other than the team they may follow now, because those, they follow and, their, their message board. Well, and those brands, right? I mean, uh, you, th- these are collegiate brands that everyone knows yes. that they follow. That's the difference between the WNBA and – there are Iowa fans everywhere. And I'm not trying to have an attachment I'm not to the state it, of the school. My initial answer is I would invest in the tournament, right? Yeah. Um, and, and ESPN. Well, did. that question I was not prepared for. And I really had to think about it. But my knee jerk response was the Masters. But I think there's merit in both right now. And that shocks me as to which one you'd rather have. Because, okay. because you, you would hope if you're women's college basketball, you ride that high of the momentum coming off of this tournament that was so well watched and that beat the men in the end. Didn't beat the men the first weekend, yeah. but as they got to the final four into the national championship, out, outrated I, the men. I thought it was interesting. Um, Richard Deitch predicted that had it been NC State against, uh, who was it, UConn? Yeah. It would have averaged, in his, in his mind, around seven to eight million was what he put on, the, on, on paper. Now, he had the astronomical numbers for any other matchup. But, you know, that's the matchup that was, to me, the, the least appealing. Yep. And it still would have pulled a great number. Now, a year from now, does it carry over? It's hard to say, man. It's hard to say. Well, and, but, uh, but here's the goal now. Make sure that it's that number that Richard Deitch pr- projected this past year. Yeah, if that's, next that's year, your if it's NC State and UConn, and you get to seven, eight million, that's a win. Because you're basically writing the same numbers you had with Caitlin Clark in the tourney for non Caitlin Clark games, right? Because Caitlin Clark did impact ratings across the board yes. in a positive way, even when she wasn't playing. When she was playing, it was monumental. But even when she wasn't, she was helping ratings for the entire sport. So it was looking at this. So it averaged what, 14 or 15 million? Yep. Is that right? Trying to see how much it averaged last year. Or, excuse, yeah, 2023. In the previous year. Just to see what, what, what it meant, what the matchup was. Well, that, the year before, when it was Iowa and um, LSU in the national championship game, that was a huge number, too. But, but it wasn't but it the wasn't same as that close, one. right? So that just the, the, the fandom. It was the, it was the Taylor Swift effect for women's college basketball. It was a version of that with Caitlin Clark. And now the WNBA holds that. But, you know, the, the Taylor Swift effect, if she wasn't present at the game, no one's switching that to the national, so tw- to the national broadcast. 12.3. Was what they averaged? 12.3 million people watched the Elite Eight matchup between Iowa okay, and okay, LSU. Okay. Um, a year, th- th- Iowa, LSU in the Elite Eight had 12.3. The year before in the national championship game, the Angel Reese Caitlin Clark game, yes. they had 16.1 million people watch. It went up to 18.7 this year okay. for Iowa, South Carolina. Okay. So they went up another 2.6. So it's a two year crest. I mean, that's gigantic numbers, too, the year before. I mean, it peaked this year. We yes. think that it peaked. And it was 16. But it was huge the year before. 16 the year before, 18.7 the next. And this uh, the March Madness final was 14-8 when UConn won yeah. again. Uh, Chad, we are seeing the transfer portal blow up. We wide knew, open. We knew it would be like this. Especially in basketball, it's wide open. Yeah. Football has been a little bit slower. In this second transfer portal window, there's not been as much noise of, of guys transferring. Uh, Jade Rashada. He's, he's on his way. He's on his way. And he's a man who likes to make a deal. Let's make a deal. Jaden Rashad. Or make a deal that falls through. <laughs> make a deal that falls through and then but go make you, another deal make and it, then yeah. sign that deal and then not like that deal and leave a year later. So he ended up. Whatever deal you can make. Back with where his father played. And now he, here he is trying to 
cash in yet again. And, well, it's what's not often considered with all of this? What's not often considered is something that we witnessed last night at this VIP business event that was set up for Tennessee football players that I'm sure a lot of dif- different big-time programs have some variation of this. Yeah. A meet and greet, let's go meet some business leaders, Here's some speech. people in different industries. They can talk to you a little bit. You can exchange phone numbers. You can know them down the road, knowing that a lot of the players aren't going to be in the NFL, and they're going to have to have jobs when they're, they're done playing football at X school. And there is so much value in being a true member of X school and an alumni of that school and having played there your entire career. I don't think we're factoring that in. What's lost in all of this is when you jump from one place to the next, if you're Jaden Rashada, uh, if you're some of these guys that you never really get firmly entrenched in one place because you want to peek into that portal and see what your value is, your value, your year-to-year value is what they're looking at right now. What's the highest dollar amount I can get right now for this year to go play for this school. Instead of thinking about what is the maximum dollar amount I can get by graduating from this school, they're playing three or four years here and being connected with that alumni base, being connected with business leaders that went to that school, being seen as a volunteer or a Georgia Bulldog or a Mississippi State Bulldog or an Iowa State Cyclone or you name the school. When you are viewed as that because you completed your task and stayed at that school and everyone remembers you as being a player at that school, it can have enormous benefits. One guy that was at the event last night, former Tennessee player, played for Lane Kiffin for a time, Marcellus Teague, Mm -hmm. who's from the state of Tennessee. (laughs) This was pre-transfer portal being wide open. Went to the University of Tennessee, played his time at Tennessee, and is now crushing it as a commercial real estate developer in the state of Tennessee. Did not have an NFL future. Was a good player. Everyone remembers him. as a guy in the state, from the state, did well for the state, stayed in state, stayed in that school. There's a monetary value for college players who stick with one school. I don't think we're considering that enough. I understand free markets. I understand trying to get top dollar, all those things. And no one's going to ultimately blame someone for doing that. I just wish they would factor in what I'm talking about right now. And that is the lifelong benefits of staying one place and always being associated with that one place. There is value there. Where I thought about this, Hutton, for the first time was not in college, but when Johnny Damon, who we've had on this show a few times, Mm -hmm. Johnny Damon left the Red Sox to go to the Yankees. Johnny Damon, one of the heroes of the scruffy 2004 Red Sox that won that World Series. I'm thinking, Johnny Damon, if he just doesn't go to the Yankees, like I know he's going to get top dollar somewhere, but if he doesn't go to the Yankees, what is the benefit of Johnny Damon to the Red Sox for the rest of his life? I'm not saying that he ruined that, but you ruined this in college. When you go from your team to a rival, you are no longer associated with that first team by the fan base. Yep. And there's business advantages to being associated with one team also. And no one's thinking about that when they're making these moves. Well, let's just le- let's use one franchise as an example in the NFL. It's a great point. Le'Veon Bell, Pittsburgh Steelers. Set out a year. Came back. And he, he, it's, it's not just if you go to a rival. It's not like he went to Baltimore. No. Uh, he would have at the end of his career. Um, it's how you leave. And the way he left rubbed everyone the wrong way, right? Yeah. Then he eventually apologizes, but years later when that happens, he says he made the mistake, which is true. I mean, he, he admits that. It's still, there's not going to be a homecoming for Le'Veon Bell. Antonio Brown, another one. Who's getting blocked by Caitlin Clark on social media and, right now. Okay, who, how many blocks do you think Antonio Brown has received? Oh, I mean. On social media. Uh, imagine his. You think that's a record? Imagine his DM activity. Like, think about what that, that sounds like. I mean. What that looks like. He, he, he sent out a children's book cover that had Brady leaving. Didn't he have Brady leaving the house? Yeah. With Giselle inside and said something yeah. about 
He's he's uh, daddy when daddy's not home or something. He's posted some questionable things with someone in the window. Yeah, I mean, look, there's. <laughs> I mean, it's just to, to your to your point though, Hutton. There's countless there, examples hey, of, and then there's Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, countless examples of if you can stay in one place for the entirety of your career. Now, a lot of times in the professional sports, it's not their it's not the player's choice. Right, right? their but, time runs out. They have to go somewhere else. They're traded, whatever it right. may be. It's always something with that, right? So there's a lot of. But then there's Big Ben who was pissed off about the way he was t- kind of treated on the way out, right? And he's still, I mean, he's still the standard for this era of Pittsburgh Steelers yeah. quarterbacks. Um, and but co- college specifically. But we're, I don't, how many times are we going to see that? Is, some, is someone smart getting in the ears of some of these college athletes and at least letting them know, okay, now, hey, uh, you got this NIL deal here currently at this school. Yeah. And this school does want to pay you $50,000 more to Which, go there this year. And they can year, find that out. Right? And when easily. you're 21 years old, everyone's looking around thinking, oh, boy, $50,000. That's, that's, you know, that's well, my lifetime Chad, earnings up to this point or even more about, than that. Think about being straight out of high school and your parents telling you that. You yeah. can make this X amount if you just, let's go here instead. You know, you, that, that's also pressure involved. The, but the it, outside noises. It's not just the one individual decision. Sometimes, I think in large part, sometimes it can be the, the, the parents because they've helped through the recruiting process as well. They've been the agent, more yeah. or less. Or they've, they've decided who the agent will be, which sometimes can be a family I, member too. I'm sure that coaches talk about this when they're sitting down oh, and having end-of-season meetings and someone's uh, talking about the portal. And they're, say, they're probably giving them the sales pitch of, which is right. To say, have you thought about what it's going to be like yeah. if you stick through this right now and finish your career here where you have a spot and what that's going to mean for your future earnings, future business relationships, everything else? Because for the rest of your life, you're going to be seen as this, right? I've, I know plenty of Marines. You're never a former Marine. You're a Marine. Whether you're active in the Marines or not, right. there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. You go through the Marine Corps. I'm not. I'm not comparing college football to the Marines. Don't, don't mistake me for what I'm saying. It's the example. But the of concept the... is similar. When you go through it, right? You're yeah. you're a Marine, and you're you're noticed as that. You're admired as that. Your connections with other Marines will always be strong for that reason because you are a Marine. You're not an ex-Marine. When you are a Kentucky Wildcat or a Notre Dame alum and you went there your entire career and finished it out, mm. you are that. You're not X. You're not everything else. You're a Vol for life. You're a Wildcat for life. You're an NC State Wolfpack member. You're in the Wolfpack for life. There's value there, and people need to understand that. But there's more, there can be more value elsewhere individually. There's that, more that, immediate and, value right there the, for their pocketbooks but, that – that they're not factoring the long-term but value, like though. But from a, a, just using the Marine example, and, and thank God there's, that there's not a transfer portal. Y- yes. You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You don't have, there's no level up from that. And in some, I mean, if you, are you always, in, first and always a Blue Raider at Middle Tennessee? You know, it's not the same if you have the opportunity to go and climb and, you know, Kevin Byard, for instance, was recruited by Kentucky by the time he was in his senior year of, of college, he could have transferred anywhere he else. He could have gone to Bama yeah. if he wanted to. And, you know, he Trent, didn't. but Trent Dilfer would say if my, at UAB, if my player has a chance to better himself and make more money and get ready for the league, so be it. I've coached him to reach that platform. Yeah. So it's not always, it, it, it's in some cases, I understand. But from the, from the if you're, you're looking at it from the, the top shelf, university programs and that's that's fair because at some places you will have connections and friendships that you'll never break away from yeah um and, and now th- look this is uh th- and, and, and now we're in an era where you leave and you go to arrival and you immediately talk trash about the team you just left yeah now there's there's different levels to this um if one is perceived to be leveling up, right? You use the Middle Tennessee example yeah. for, for Kevin Byard. Or UAB Byard. with, yeah. If but, Kevin Byard left Middle Tennessee to go play for Nick Saban at Alabama and was a starting safety for a Nick Saban-led national championship team, there's value there, right? There's, there's right, value right. in being that if you're fall. Kevin Byard 
for the rest of your life. Yeah, I won a national title at Alabama. Yeah. Played at MTSU. Hearts at MTSU, but also I'm a, I'm a Bama guy too. But he goes into the league as a there's, there's value Kevin in that. Byard, Alabama. Right. But, and this is where it's not fair. For, for t- teams of that level that's not in the Power Four, not even some of the top programs in the country, the value is seen as when you level up, oh, now I can finish my career at Ohio State, right. and I can be a Buckeye, and I can get all those benefits of being a Buckeye after starting my career at Miami of Ohio and then transferring on. I, I get that. You know, There's some hypocrisy there in terms of how we view that, but I, I would caution those that are at places that – have a rabid, well-connected fan base, like the one we saw last night in the yes. business community, yes. that has a lot of people with a lot of money around it, that's well-connected in business, in that state, whatever it may be. When you start there, you play there, you're going to school there, and you start to blow up and you think, I can go and double and triple right now my earnings by transferring – just factor in what you're giving up on the back end of not being associated with that one school throughout your entire career. And that's a part of a culture. Yes. You know, it's a part of longevity for a coach as well because that, that, that starts with the leadership of the athletic department, with AD and coach. It doesn't start from the outside with a collective because you have to have the, the program and the university embrace it. And it's tough to find that tight-knit team now. Yeah. Because it's just piecemeal in every level. You know? and, and look, coaches are much more open now about going to their collectives or someone and saying, hey, this guy would be a lot happier if he could make just as much as this other player on our roster. And I'm here to tell you this player is very important to what we do. And we need them coming back and we want them happy. Right? There, there are, yeah. I'm sure, emotional pleas to collectives or boosters that if we can get this guy a little bit more happy, then we want him to stay. I'm sure that goes on too. So – um Where's Rashada going to go? Probably, four, probably not back to Florida. He, he has four years of eligibility. So Good question. I don't. I mean, I don't know. So it lasts through the end of the month. The portal. So we'll we'll follow him well, daily. Now, so this this late, you know, the post spring portal opportunity, you really get into those that are going to offer Jane Rashada. Know they're screwed at the quarterback position right now. They're he's looking around him. after spring and they're saying we're not good enough at quarterback. Yeah. So we need this guy. If you're Jaden Rashada, you're not going to compete or be a backup. You're going somewhere where you're going to be the starter. We, or you feel like you're 80, 90% sure you're going to win the starting job because of the quarterback situation at that school. Well, here's what happened to him, though. He started Arizona State's season as, last year as a starter and then missed most of the season with a, a knee injury. And then he didn't even participate in spring ball with Arizona State because of a thumb issue. He had, su- he had surgery. Yeah, that's right. So he got hurt. So Arizona State went out. They have a, a, a senior quarterback, and then they added Sam Levitt uh, from Michigan State. Again. Uh, He's going to go somewhere and, and start, would be my guess. And you really don't have much of, a, much of a, a chance to develop him or get him ready for the, for the system at all. Uh, Kenny Dillingham posted this. I mean, I, I get the sense it's kind of mutual. Someone will be getting an elite athlete and a great person. We'll always be rooting for you. Head coach at Arizona State. It's that doesn't the, sound like a... It's the only way to go right now if you're a head coach. Because even if you are bitter and you are angry, being public about your bitterness or anger is not going to help you at all. But it, And these guys are smart <laughs> enough to know that. But this wasn't a Mitch Barnhart tweet. <laughs> no. <laughs> about Calipari. John Calipari will be returning for his 15th season. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thanks, he will, Mitch. He will be returning for Appreciate a 60 season. Appreciate that vote of confidence. After, Not even we've decided anything. After meeting with Coach. After meeting with Coach. Yeah, and he's going to he, be here. He's, he will be here. He's going to continue to keep office hours. We decided that he'll be the coach. He'll he keep his normal <laughs> office hours, and he will continue to be the head coach of Kentucky. <laughs> his name will be on the outside of his office. It's the last I'm talking about. <laughs> it's the last time I'm going to address it. You'll hear from him on his coach's show tonight. Not, not at, even uh, yes. Not even the word yes. It's just yeah. yeah Many of you have asked me if Galapagos going to be back. Yeah. He'll be at Malone's tonight for his coach's show, and he can address you in person there if you'd like. He'll give a pep talk tonight. I'm not talking about it again.